So maybe morning or a little bit later in the evening, but it's a real pleasure to have you with us this afternoon to have a conversation with Robert Zellick, who just really has a very rich um, experience as a practitioner. And uh, if you've read his book, a lot of um, uh, expertise as a scholar as well. Um, I'm really pleased to look through the participant list and see so many students from the school, alumni from the school, of course our faculty is well represented. We have board members, presidential advisor group members, um, and uh, friends from all across the campus. So thank you all for joining us for this conversation. Um, our guest of honor is a former uh, World Bank president, former deputy secretary of state, former US trade representative. So we have a lot to learn from him. Um, as you'll hear is the combination on Conversation Unfolds, his recent book on American diplomatic history is rich with detail. I highly recommend it to all of you. I'm especially intrigued by the five themes that he teases out, which I know are going to come. We're going to learn more about as the conversation unfolds, um, which will be guided by our very own Dr. Anne Marie Murphy, who is a professor in the School of Diplomacy, our expert on foreign policy and Southeast Asia, heads our Center for Foreign Policy Studies. And we're very pleased that she's going to be guiding us through a conversation, which will also be, of course, open to questions from all of you via the chat. But we're going to begin uh, with a with a conversation between Dr. Murphy and I uh, and Mr. Zolik, and we'll move on from there. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Murphy to begin us on, uh, through the conversation. Thank you all again. Well, thank you very much, Dean Smith, and um, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here today to this talk with the Honorable uh, Robert Zellick. As Dean Smith has indicated, uh, Robert Zellick is one of America's most extremely, uh, excuse me, experienced uh, and accomplished statesmen. He served, as uh, Dean Smith noted, as president of the World Bank, as deputy secretary of state, as the U.S. trade representative, and as counselor at both the Treasury and State Department. And he brings that wealth and depth of experience, as well as a real passion for history, to this fascinating new book that I can't recommend highly enough, America in the World, history of U.S. diplomacy and foreign policy. And Bob is here to, with us today at a particularly challenging time for the United States, both at home and abroad. Obviously, we're here amidst a terrible pandemic that has had horrific economic and social consequences amidst domestic political dysfunction in Washington, and of course amidst an extremely challenging period um, in the international environment. And it's not always easy to try to find a path to move forward, but the starting point for doing so is to have a better understanding of how we've gotten to this place in time and what has animated American foreign policy, both at its best as well as at its worst, over the last two odd centuries. And that is exactly what Mr. Zellick does for us in this book. It is an exceptional book full of rich narrative, very well-crafted character portraits, and extremely useful insights. And a key theme of the book is that America uh, has traditionally had its foreign policy been shaped by a pragmatism um, and that this has been critical to American uh, diplomatic practitioners since our country's founding. And it's a problem solving bent that he argues sets American diplomacy apart from European and other traditions. And so that is a key theme of this book. He also talks a lot about the conflicting tensions between this pragmatic preoccupation with problem solving, as well as with a um, sense of exceptionalism that has sometimes drawn us into misguided efforts to remake the world in our image. So in short, this book could not be better timed to help us understand the way forward at this period in history when geopolitical competition has reemerged with a vengeance and we are facing the challenge of grappling with climate change, pandemic, and the revolution in technology. And all of these challenges are beyond the reach of any one country. So there is nobody better to help us understand this than Bob Zellick. And so as Dean Smith said, please put your questions in the chat. 
Um, and now I'd like to begin our conversation. And I'd like to begin at the beginning. Um, so Bob, perhaps you could tell us what motivated you to write this book? Well, first, Anne-Marie, let me thank you for hosting this and it's saying it's a, it's a delight to be at Seton Hall. Uh, my only request for you, Anne-Marie, is that I notice those bookshelves are a little thin behind you. So <laughs> get done with this. Maybe you could put my book up there for, for future reference. Well, I, I have it right here, but yes, you know, no, I have a whole I, slew of them going by. <laughs> So, um, when I was in government, uh, I often drew on history in thinking through problems. And so, one of the genesis of this book was to encourage others, uh, especially the next generation, perhaps some of the people in this audience, to think in those terms. Uh, Anne Marie and I had talked a little bit in prior weeks that many foreign policy courses focus on international relations theories. And they're fun, they're good to master. But um, what I found is when I was dealing with practical issues of German unification or trade policy or development or NAFTA or genocide in Darfur, they really didn't give me as much uh, practical guidance. And so, as she mentioned, I, I tried to organize this book in a way that focused on practical problems. Some of you may know that uh, Henry Kissinger wrote a book titled Diplomacy in the 1990s, where he used history to focus on diplomacy. But being Henry Kissinger, it tended to have the European real politics perspective. So for a number of years, actually decades, I've been trying to think, how could I do this in a way that would talk about the American experience and American ideas? And I suppose uh, one other idea in the back of my mind is that in many of those jobs that I had, I had younger colleagues as assistants or, or part of a team and because I liked history, I would often ask them about what they knew about history. And I discovered that insofar as they had learned some history, it tended to be from World War II on. And so one of the ideas in this book was to try to recall the first 150 years of the United States, where there's some fascinating people that I wanted to recall from the mists of time and some very, very good insights as well. And so, as Anne-Marie mentioned, I organized it around stories. I wanted to appeal to a larger audience in some way, the book is a multiple biography um, and particular episodes. So it's not comprehensive of all 200 plus years, but it does cover a lot of the key elements. And um, in, in drawing out the, the stories, I also did so in a way that tried to highlight some of the ideas. And I also included some of my own personal assessments based on my experience. So as I drafted the book, I had a, a seminar at Harvard of faculty and graduate students, and they kept encouraging me to add my own uh, sort of interpretation of events. So I tried to do that as well. OK, well, um, I would love to have you um, expound perhaps on some of the characters, as you say, that you discussed in your stories. And I love the way that um, he did orient his book around these stories, um, beginning with America's first diplomat, Benjamin Franklin. Um, I grew up in a town with two middle schools. We were very patriotic. I actually went to Benjamin Franklin Middle School, but I must confess I did not know as much about him uh, then until I read your book. Um, so there's obviously quite a number of uh, statesmen that you discuss in that book. I thought perhaps um, we could talk a little bit about the story of Cordial Hull. I do realize that brings us to post-World War II history. So if there's somebody you'd like to bring up from an earlier date, please do so. Um, but he certainly devoted his life um, to the idea that trade could lessen the risks of war, build prosperity, and create friendships um, among countries um, that are certainly uh, relevant at this point in time when protectionism is on the rise, free trade is under attack. So perhaps um, you could talk a little bit about Cordial Hull and what some of the implications of his life's work uh, hold for us today. So Hull was one of those figures that, that really uh, comes from the, from the interwar period. For those of you that have never heard of the name, he actually was the longest serving Secretary of State. He served under Franklin Roosevelt uh, 11 years and nine months. He didn't make his mark in what we'll call the 
traditional foreign policy or the World War II policy, because frankly, Franklin Roosevelt kept much of that to himself. Um, but uh, as Anne Marie said, he, he uh, I use this chapter to focus on trade and foreign policy. And the starting point was that Cordell Hull had uh, served many years in Congress. That was his sort of political base. And I try to use this the, his discussion to give you a, a, a wider window on issues of trade, uh, constitutional power, also domestic politics. So probably the key starting point is that some of you may have heard of something called the Smoot-Hawley Act of 1930. This was uh, at the start of the Great Depression. It raised the average share of the United States to 59.1%. And combined with the general breakdown of the world economy, U.S. trade fell by 40 to 70 percent, depending on value or volume. So devastating effects. And for those of you that focus on bilateral trade surpluses, I could say that the United States had a bilateral trade surplus in the 30s, but it also had 25 percent unemployment. So that's a variable you have to watch out for. Now, Hall, uh, given his background working on the Ways and Means Committee in the, of the Senate, convinces uh, Roosevelt uh, to take up a, a piece of legislation called the Reciprocal Trade Act of 1934. And uh, for those of you who are students of the legislative process, if you go back and you look at the act, as I did, it'll be, it's a shocker, because it's only three pages long. And I don't know of any piece of legislation that's only three pages long. The key part of this act was it shifted the responsibility from trade from the Congress, which for decades had set individual tariffs on thousands of items, to the executive branch, giving the executive branch authority to lower. So the political dynamic shifts from how high to set tariffs to agreements uh, to lower tariffs, giving the executive branch the prime responsibility. And that's the system that carried forward for some 80 years. So some of you will read about things like fast track or today, under my actually time when I was trade representative, we changed the name to Trade Promotion Authority. This was the, the grant of constitutional authority to the executive branch to negotiate these agreements. And the idea was that normally the president and the executive branch will take a national view as opposed to a view of one state or one constituency. And normally that means that the president's or the executive branch will take a more liberalizing view. Now, we've had a recent test of this because President Trump was really the first president uh, since uh, Herbert Hoover, who took a protectionist approach. And in fact, there's a piece in the Wall Street Journal today, an op-ed by this by Phil Graham, a former senator, and, and Toomey of Pennsylvania, a current senator. Now, taking this authority, then Hull had to bring it to life. And what Hull did is over the course of his tenure, he negotiated some 31 agreements with 28 countries. These were not free trade agreements, which you hear discussed today, but they did try to lower tariffs. They brought tariffs down to the pre smoot hawley level. And equally important, each of the tariffs had some core principles about what's called most favored nation, sometimes now referred to as normal trade relations because the most favored nation has become our norm, and non-discrimination and trying to change all barriers into tariffs so you could lower those. And that's important because those became the core principles for something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was then the U.S. pushed in 1947 to open up the trading system after World War II. And the GATT system is now incorporated into what you read about, the World Trade Organization. But one of the other points is this chapter tries to highlight is the trade issues have never been easy because they're domestic political fights. And even during uh, Hull's tenure, he had fights over what one would call managed trade. So even after he got the authority to negotiate these agreements, he had a competitor named George uh, Peak, who basically wanted to do barter agreements. It said this is a form of managed trade. And I, I tell the story because it's got some wonderful overtones. Peak actually negotiates an agreement with Germany in the 30s where you're trading U.S. cotton for wine and you don't have to sort of use the normal market mechanisms. And the agreement is actually uh, Roosevelt has signed off on. But Hull brings to the president's attention that not only would it destroy the rest of the negotiations we're trying to have, including with Brazil, which was a cotton exporter, 
But he brings to Roosevelt's attention that Nazi Germany in the 30s had raised a lot of animosities. And maybe this wasn't a very good country to do an agreement with, particularly because it would save the hard currency from Nazi Germany, which it then used to buy weapons. And he actually got Roosevelt to reserve, reverse his position. And that was actually requires some very strong political skill if one recalls about uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Now, going back to just a couple other points on this, as Anne Marie mentioned, kind of Hull was a, of a view that sort of came out of the Woodrow Wilson area that maybe trade is the key to peace. And I, I don't think one can go so far as to say that trade can ensure peace, but it certainly is part of trying to build prosperity and friendships with that. It probably lessens the risks of conflicts with partners. Um, certainly we've seen that economic miseries around the world uh, lead to uh, difficult security problems. Witness uh, Central America today and the immigration flows in part from the economic and, and security problems there. And also an important point I try to draw out in the book is that trade and economic cooperation becomes the foundation for other types of cooperation. So if you're thinking about environmental issues or biological security issues, it's a similar cooperative network. So as I mentioned, Hall would not probably meet most foreign affairs experts, uh, sort of high ranking of best secretaries of state for foreign policy, uh, but he is a wonderful person to give you a window on trade policy. All right, well, and you've certainly illustrated why. Um, you know, one of the things that I found fascinating about your book was learning about individuals that I had never heard before that had such a significant impact um, on US foreign policy and competitive risk, competitiveness writ large. Um, and you tell this story about um, Vannevar Bush, uh, a scientist uh, who worked at MIT, he was labeled uh, the inventor of the future, and who played a really critical role uh, in ensuring that the United States invested in basic science, working with private public partnerships, universities, um, and that this really laid the foundation for much of the US uh, technological and economic dominance um, in the post-World War II era. So could you speak uh, a little bit about Vannevar Bush? Because I don't know if anybody out there has uh, heard of him either. And then perhaps some of the lessons that uh, his experience might hold at a time when, you know, the United States competitiveness and leader as uh, a high tech um, country has been challenged by many others, particularly China. So I'm glad you enjoyed that chapter. Um, <laughs> As you mentioned, uh, in, you won't find Van Iver Bush show up in most foreign policy studies. Um, although if you're a student of science and science history or at Stanford, uh, he's a well-known name. Um, as, as you mentioned, Anne-Marie, he was uh, an accomplished uh, president and vice president or vice president and professor at MIT. He becomes head of the Carnegie Science Institution. Um, but for me, he's the godfather of uh, an American diplomacy that leverages uh, perpetual science and technological change. So again, to put this in context, some of my chapters focus on what you've probably studied of geopolitics. I bring in a lot of economics. That's a, some of my background. But this is the chapter that I wanted to bring science and technology to the fore. So he really gets his start in World War II. He, he had persuades Franklin Roosevelt to let him assemble a committee that uh, really tries to fuse technology uh, with, with warfare. And he comes up, as opposed to creating a big bureaucracy, he comes up with a contract system to work with universities and private institutions. And it becomes quite key in the U-boat campaign, how they integrate different systems. Uh, it's important with the development of radar, uh, medicines, uh, the proximity fuse, which was a very important effort. And of course, most significant, he's the principal liaison with President Roosevelt for the atomic bomb project. Now, in, uh, in, in 1944, he uh, basically works with Roosevelt's staff to have Roosevelt uh, send him a letter that asks him about future science policy. So this is a good lesson for those of you interested in the policy side. He gets the request to do this report about future science policy. And it, the report uh, is 
quite extensive, but but what uh, what Bush puts together is a, a overview that's called Science: The Endless Frontier. And again, for those of you who studied geopolitics, notes what's happening here. We're not just talking about sort of Eurasia or maritime or land powers. It's it's the endless frontier. Um, and he really devises a system that at Stanford has been labeled the triple helix. And what it, in essence, it's the idea that government supports basic research in universities, but you also have uh, the private sector. So the bigger idea behind this, which is that um, Bush, who was quite an independent person in his own manner, wanted to have a place for, for mavericks and independent thinkers within a security system. And he, he wins some, he loses some. If you read the chapter, you'll see he has some frustrations of this. But um, in my view, this becomes quite important with the competition with the Soviet Union in the Cold War, where it's a command economy technology system. And as Anne-Marie alluded to, I think it's actually got some insights for dealing with China today. And for those of you that are curious a little bit about sometimes how does history relate to policy, um, actually, there's a bill submitted in the Senate by Senator Schumer of New York and Todd Young of, of Indiana, a Democrat and Republican, that's called the Endless Frontier Act. <laughs> and guess what it's about? It's about investment in science and, and technology. But there's another point in this chapter I wanted to draw, which is that uh, in 1992, when I was working for Secretary James Baker, he had recused himself because he owned oil stocks. And so I was the lead person dealing with the cl climate change framework agreement, which is the foundation for all the subsequent uh, conferences of the parties that you may have read about. And I wanted to introduce the idea about science and diplomacy um, because it struck me that this is going to be increasingly important, whether it's climate change or biological security and pandemics and the challenge of how you integrate those uh, subjects together. And then the last point about uh, Van Iver Bush, this, it's so good you can't make this stuff up, is that uh, in July 45, which was the year he does the Endless Frontier Report, it's the test for the atomic bomb in, in July, he also publishes an article, uh, I think it was in the Atlantic Monthly, and he basically is envisioning what he calls a Memex machine. And it's, it's basically a desktop device to give you access to information and link and others. And what you're really seeing is at a time that we're just starting to get big computers, he's imagining the notion of a personal computer. And to make it even richer, it turns out that a young man who's sent off to the Philippines after World War II as a radar technician comes across a reprint of this article in a Red Cross library in Leyte on stilts. And he's so interested in it, he comes back and he becomes one of the leading computer scientists who helps develop the personal computer. And indeed, Silicon Valley was started by uh, a provost at Stanford, who was one of Van Iver Bush's graduate students. So you, it's a wonderful way of seeing a person in an article and, and seeing the linkages uh, through what we do today. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, you have to go out and read the book because there's lots of other fascinating uh, characters and stories uh, to learn about. Um, but at this point, I think what I'd like to do is to take some of the overarching lessons um, from these different individuals and the challenges that they found and um, talk about what Bob discusses as five um, traditions of US diplomacy. And as he noted, he often found these lessons from history more useful than IR theories, uh, as he stated when grappling with the Darfurian situation or what have you. And I can assure you, Bob, that many of our students would much prefer to read your stories um, than some of our, our, our theory classes. Um, so the first lesson or the first tradition that you have is um, the importance of North America, which you call the foundation for U.S. global power, and how it's so critically important for the U.S. to cultivate good political and economic relations with the United States. Um, and we recently saw Joe Biden um, have his meeting with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, in which he stated that Canada had no better friend than um, the United States. So President Biden appears certainly to agree with you. Um, but as you know, very often North America seems to disappear from 
the US foreign policy agenda. So can you discuss a little bit about why you think North America is so critical uh, to the US global power um, and why it might not always rise to such a high level on the foreign policy agenda? So I, I'd be delighted to, uh, but let me just take a slight tangent because you began with the notion of, of history and policy. And I thought this would be interesting to draw out a little bit for the students, maybe for some of the faculty members. Uh, and it's, uh, as you could tell with this book, it's a field I've given some thought to. There were there was a man, a, actually a great diplomatic historian named Ernest May and Richard Newstadt, mm -hmm. who was a, well, we've got a lot of people joining us wrote today. a book titled Thinking in Time. And mm -hmm. it was an effort to try to uh, assess how you could draw on history for policy. And the, and the book, can be a little dense, but it, at heart, um, what it, it suggests is uh, a lot of people use history through analogies, and they caution about that. And I actually uh, make the same caution because w while people often use analogies as a way of advocacy, it can often mislead you. They, they don't really fit so well. But what they point to, and frankly, my experience has been to use history to think of questions to ask. And, and just ask yourself again, if somebody presented you with a problem, whatever the problem, you know, maybe it's something at home or school or, or a diplomatic problem, is that wouldn't your first question be, well, what happened before? And kind of what worked, what didn't work and why? And that's the starting point of, of history. And then going beyond that, when I think about a problem today, it, ones I actually converse with with friends or some of the people in the government, you often ask yourself, what institutions are involved? What processes are involved? What people are involved? And what are their histories? So here you're moving beyond sort of general rational analysis to try and understand how to make something work. Very important in foreign affairs is how do others view their histories? You may not agree with it, but it's awful useful to know. And what history I think brings is a multidisciplinary approach. And so all of you at the School of Diplomacy, Seton Hall, this is I think probably a natural, but you're trying to connect the dots and see interrelationships. And I suppose one other insight is history suggests we have to expect the unexpected. Um, so, you know, what really drives the, the life of history are the discontinuities, not the straight lines. And if you even think about, you know, your own sort of a life, think about, you know, whether it's the, the Trump administration, whether it's 9-11, the global financial crisis, pandemic, these are not straight line events. Um, and one other point, particularly for those of you considering a diplomatic field is I, what, what I think history and the stories try to suggest is try to recognize that sometimes imperfect results can be okay in a far from perfect world. You know, you know, so you can have critiques later and everybody says what's wrong, but sometimes moving the ball ahead is, is quite useful. And maybe also a tinge of optimism at a time that people are a little gloomy, which is I always think about history as kind of offering insights on, on how to do better rather than a notion of timeless obstacles. Now, to take it to North America, as Anne-Marie mentioned, if you go on the website for foreign policy or foreign affairs or Council on Foreign Relations or various groups, you'll rarely find a piece on North America. You'll see things on the Middle East and Europe and Asia and maybe a little bit on Africa and Latin America. And so it's left out of most discussions of U.S. foreign policy. But as my the tales in my book suggest, you know, certainly in the 19th century, North America was where the action was. But even in the 20th century, we almost went to war again with Mexico in 1917. Um, the Kaiser in Germany in 1917 had this brilliant idea of trying to, it's called the Zimmerman telegram. He said, he, so told the Mexicans, why don't you join us in fighting the United States and in return you can reclaim Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So for those of you who know history, for some reason he left out California. I don't know what he was going to do with California, but he was going to give Mexico back the different lands. And of course, for those of you that studied nuclear diplomacy, the Caribbean and the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 is the signal sort of, uh, sort of uh, atomic diplomacy event. Or NAFTA, the North, North American Free Trade Agreement, which I was involved in, this was much more than a trade agreement. It was a recognition that the old political order of Mexico, built on the old what's called the PRI, the Corporatist Party, was breaking down. And the question would be, 
where were the pieces attached? And that's frankly an issue that you're, you're seeing still go on in Mexico today. And I came across a, uh, a speech by Ronald Reagan in 1979 as he launched his campaign. It was just a wonderful speech. You, it's hard to imagine today. He says, the United States would be better off if our nearest neighbors, Mexico and Canada, were stronger, not weaker. And it's time that we quit thinking of our nearest neighbors as foreigners, which sounds a little different than the rhetoric of the past four years. Um, but another way of thinking about this is that if you, if you think about the subjects that most Americans are interested in in foreign policy, immigration, maybe narcotics and criminal matters, environment, sort of economic, that's a North American agenda. How are we going to work with Canada and Mexico? Or frankly, we can now add the Arctic with global climate change. And one other point that I've always emphasized in my work was not just to think about these in purely continental terms, but to think about the continent as a base for US policy globally. So you know, China has 1.3 billion people, India is about the same number. But if you think about North America as a unit, you've got about 500 million people, three democracies, energy efficiency or energy self-sufficiency, ability to export, better demographics than China, Europe, Japan, sort of others. If we start to see the, the laborers, the, the, the human resources as a true uh, sort of resource as opposed to a problem, which brings you back to issues of education and sort of the right uh, programs for, for, for dealing with people. Um, and uh, I, in much of my work, I was also trying to then connect Mexico and Canada with the United States in our work abroad, whether it was on climate issues or trade issues or, or other topics. So. I partly see North America not only in its own terms, but it, in a in a global context for the U.S. Okay, sorry that took me a little minute. I've been told that there was some background noise coming through. This uh, office is right next to the uh, entrance to the Seton Hall campus, so uh, we're getting a little noise there. Um, so let me just say, you know, Bob, one thing we do here at the School of Diplomacy is we infuse a lot of our classes with critical thinking skills, and we teach our students what a critical thinker is and does, etc. And the first thing we teach them is that a critical thinker raises vital questions and your use of history which when you read the book you will see that he calls history is simply the memory of states and how this memory of states can help people today ask the vital questions that need to be asked to address the problems um, students that is why we teach you those critical thinking skills okay um so the second tradition um that bob discusses in his book he labels trade translation transnationalism and technology obviously his discussion of cordial hill and vanderbilt bush illustrated the importance that many statesmen and he himself uh, attached to this and yet today we see that the U.S. is in the process of reassessing its commitment to globalization with its open trade, uh, open technology regimes. Um, and protectionism is higher now than any time since the 1930s and the Smoot-Hawley uh, Act that you discuss. So particularly with your background as the U.S. Trade Representative, can you uh, tell our students and others in our audience um, why a breakdown of free trade could be so costly uh, to the United States and what steps can be taken to try to uh, forestall that? So I'm pleased to do that, uh, that to start with the historical context. Um, if you go back to 1776, um, Many of you may recall uh, the Committee for the Declaration of Independence, which uh, John Adams served on, but Thomas Jefferson was the author. But Adams had his own committee, and it was the committee to create the Model Treaty of the United States. So the Model Treaty of 1776, if you look at it, is basically a trade agreement. And what this suggested to me is that trade was more than about economic efficiency. The economic efficiency is very important, but it's about America's ties with the world. And, and recall the context in 1776, or frankly, in the 18th century. This is a world of, of empires. It's a world of mercantilism. It's government-controlled trade. So what the United States was in part trying to do 
was open relations to what today we would call the transnational actors. They were trying to open them to private parties. Um, and if you think about this, this, this is one of the core aspects of really what differentiated America's role in the world, whether it's business people, whether it's missionaries, whether it's engineers, civil society groups and NGOs, soldiers of fortune, uh, the Catholic Church. <laughs> so this is, these are the non-governmental actors that are quite important. And sometimes you'll see this show up in the phrase that, that Joe and I used about soft power. Um, but of course, trade does have important economic benefits. Um, what, what the record shows is that export industries tend to have higher productivity because they're more competitive. They tend to pay higher wages. Obviously, for farmers in America, um, as I was explaining to one group recently, sort of the difference between $5 a bushel soybeans and $14 to $15 a bushel soybeans is trade with China. And so the farm community tends to have an interest in this. It obviously means lower prices and more competition. Um, there have been studies shown about what a difference it makes, actually, particularly for sort of working families over buying clothes or school supplies or others. But a point that's often lost is that about half America's imports are either raw materials or intermediate goods. And so it's key to the uh, efficiency and competitiveness of, of the other uh, export industry. As I alluded to with Cordell Hall, it's also part of an idea about prosperity and ties um, about around the world. And as we saw in the 1930s, economic miseries can lead to political disasters. Um, we saw, um, you know, it's an interesting case in Japan for those of you that study East Asia. There was actually an effort in Japan in the 1920s to focus on a more balanced role in the world, uh, particularly with trade and economics. It kind of lost out to sort of a more militarist approach, in part because of the protectionism and breakdown in trade. And some of you may have read about the Japanese uh, East Asia co-prosperity sphere. They were trying to develop their own bloc. And then Japan returns to the economic strategy quite successfully uh, after World War II. And it's quite important in the world of developing economies uh, to be able to succeed. Um, as I mentioned before, trade certainly can't ensure peace, but it can lessen risks. And if you think about it in this way, sometimes people think about international politics in a zero sum calculation. One wins, one loses. Well, what trade and economics should be about is all parties benefiting. And as I also alluded to, if you're thinking about dealing with transnational issues like climate, um, you know, how, you're going to have to have an economic dimension in this. How do you bring in the developing countries? How do they see this as part of a growth? Um, and frankly, it's going to be true whether you're dealing with financial crises or biological security. Um, and one of the other things about trade, of course, is, is that the WTO system set up something quite unique, a, a dispute settlement system. So by which people agree to principles and agree to determination. It doesn't give up a nation's sovereignty. You can still do what you wish, but if you violate the rules, the other party can retaliate. And that's the system that you saw sort of break down uh, during the Trump years, and we'll see whether it gets back on track now. One other point for the US is because our economy tends to be cutting edge, tends to be on the advanced side, we often need the rules for new industries, whether it's intellectual property or service sector or uh, other types of technology. So what you tended to see is American administrations were sort of pushing the envelope about trying to come up with new rules and standards for the uh, international system. When we step back from agreements, obviously, we, we kind of lost that. Now, the key in Anne-Marie's question that relates to this is we haven't been as good as we should be in helping people adapt to change. Now, economists will have a great debate. You know, is this due to trade? Is it due to technology? It doesn't really matter, in my view, whatever causes the disruption. But I think one of the fundamental choices you see is that the politics tend to argue for protecting what exists. Um, because those are the people in the jobs, those are the existing industries. It's a little harder to say, well, I'm going to be moving for rules for industries that will be created. But if you even think about sort of the developments in my lifetime or Anne Marie's has been a pretty big change in the nature of the world economy. One example I sometimes use in this is that I think if you go back and you look at the share of the U.S. economy around 1900, agriculture was about 40 percent of the employment. 
Um, well, today agriculture is probably about 1%, but as a share of GDP, it's probably the same or higher as it was before. So you've seen huge productivity in the agriculture area. So you're right to focus on this one, Anne-Marie. I think uh, for the various multilateralism efforts that the administration, the new administration is making, this is gonna be the one that's most difficult for them. And you can already see them hedging a little bit on it. My own view, and for those of you who studied East Asia, economics and trade is the coin of the realm in East Asia. And frankly, given the nature of the way the European Union was set up, trade is critical to the power of the Economic Commission. So I think you'll find that there'll be pressure on the administration to figure out how, to, how does it try to deal with some of the protectionist constituencies while moving forward? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that very much. Um, you know, I thought your point about how the United States has to be at the forefront of setting standards for many of these global technologies is so critical. Um, we had a group of graduate students last week and we watched certain Brookings Institution webinars on the Uyghur repression by China and how China is using, you know, AI technology, facial recognition, et cetera, uh, in its efforts to police its people. And, you know, some of the speakers were saying that in discussions at the UN and elsewhere to try to set the standards for AI technology in the security field, um, the US has pretty much been absent and China has been right there. And that has some really horrific implications for the future um, if that does not begin to change. Um, so see, not just on trade, implications for human rights as well. Um, okay, the third tradition that Bob discusses is the importance of alliances and order. Um, he notes that U.S. problems are more easily solved when we work with allies rather than facing them alone. And the book actually ends on a, an optimistic note stating that despite the Trump administration's withdrawal from uh, of U.S. leadership from much of the global order, um, that you believe that the U.S. has the capacity to shape the future um, and that this capacity is greater than some observers might believe. Um, clearly, President Biden has said repeatedly the U.S. is back. Um, he wants to restore U.S. leadership. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges you believe the U.S. faces as it seeks to restore and renew its allies and partnerships um, around the world and how a pragmatic problem solver would go about trying to address those challenges. So many of you, when you probably studied history in high school or maybe even some early college courses, uh, saw discussions of isolationism, and particularly in the 1930s or other pieces, other eras. What I try to emphasize in the book is that for the first 150 years, America has an allergy to alliances. And remember, this is because of Washington warning in his farewell address about, you know, no permanent alliances, and Jefferson says no entangling alliances. And we associated those alliances with the old politics of, of, of Europe. Um, so if you think, if, if you, when you look at a number of the chapters, there are almost ways in which the United States is trying to engage in the world without alliances, whether trade or international law or other cooperation agreements. And then all of a sudden in 1947 to 1949, you have this very sharp shift. And as what this chapter describes is it, it really wasn't planned. So the alliance system that you grew up with and that I grew up with was not designed, if you go look at sort of what FDR and even Eisenhower and others were sort of saying at the time, and but it evolves out of a series of events, and I, I won't repeat each of those, but it becomes a new type of alliance system, a new way of defining alliances, linked, by the way, to an international economic system. And over the next 70 years, one goes through an adaptation of this process. Um, and by the way, manage, leading alliances isn't such an easy thing. What we learned in Berlin was, you know, are we willing to put the United States at risk to defend uh, uh, our Berlin from threats uh, from East Germany or the Soviet Union? Uh, we learned in Vietnam, how far should our security protection extend? So it's not an easy process. 
uh, I was very involved with this in the sort of the closing chapter of the Cold War with German unification and sort of the question about could we have a united Germany uh, within NATO and then the issues about NATO's uh, enlargement. President Trump obviously took a much more transactional approach. And by the nature, he didn't think about this as systemically. He tended to see these relations sort of more zero sum. Um, in my experience, when I worked for, again, Secretary Baker and President Bush 41. They're quite skilled at being able to put together the coalitions. You know, in the first Gulf War, we actually got everybody else to pay for the thing, <laughs> which by bringing the money together, as well as, uh, you know, a UN blessing and over 40 countries being part of it. So if you bring that to today, uh, Anne-Marie, I, I guess I'd start with a couple points. One, the, of course, the, the first challenges will be at home. And here I would, I'll, I'll draw another historical reference. When, when Baker was chief of staff to Ronald Reagan in 1981, he said, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. So today it's pandemic and economic recovery. So for those of you keeping taking notes or keeping score here, you know, within 18 months, uh, President Biden's strength will depend on how well he does with the pandemic and economic recovery. Um, but, and actually I think uh, Tony Blinken's given a speech today where you'll be talking, I saw some, some excerpts from it, is that uh, you can leverage some of the domestic actions internationally. And this takes you right back to the transnational issues. So note, if you're gonna be dealing with immigration issues, well, that takes you back into Mexico and, and, uh, and, and Central America. Climate issues, pandemic and biological security, cyber questions. And that leads you, of course, to what you see them trying to do, which is rebuild the relationships with allies. And that's not a bad agenda to try to think about with those allies. Um, as I alluded to, I think they're going to find a little difficulty if they don't have a trade component. And I think right now they're a little careful, they're sort of reluctant to do that. Um, but then you also can't ignore the traditional security issues. So these will change in form. So we saw with Russia and the, the Baltic states, for example, or Ukraine, different hybrid forms of aggression, um, as you saw in Crimea or Eastern Ukraine, uh, proliferation issues, cybersecurity issues, which go to the core of our democracy, uh, changing military technology. Now, I try to combine a certain uh, sort of positive attitude, but with also a realistic assessment of power. And what you will find in the world is, is that even for the disruptions of the, our alliance ties over the past uh, four years or so, that there's still a lot of countries in the world that are gonna rely on America's security. Uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, for all the talk you see in the European Union, when you look at the French forces in, in Africa, notice where the logistics and lift and, and intelligence sort of comes from. And of course, this is where the US military has been trained in these forces. So and frankly, you cannot rise to senior ranks in the US military unless you've had joint commands, that means beyond your service, and often sort of a combined responsibility. So this will always, I, I, on the security side, certainly there's been some breach of trust and confidence, but I don't think it's such a bad thing, for example, if the Europeans decide they have to build up some of their own security capacity at the end of the day, they're still going to need to work closely with the United States. But I think what I partly try to identify on the alliance topic is that it's, it's not just the traditional Cold War alliance relations. You've got a different set of issues here. And as we've discussed, they increasingly will involve economics and technology and transnational agendas. Okay. Well, your point about the critical role of domestic politics to form policy is a segue to your fourth tradition, uh, which the, um, is the importance of public and congressional support. So ladies and gentlemen in the audience, before I go into my question, I just want to flag that in a few minutes we're going to go to Q&A. I only have one question in the Q&A, and I know that there's more out there. So let's, uh, let's get those rolling in, please. Um, so in your discussion of the importance of public and congressional support, um, you, you know, you really state that the U.S. is unlikely to be successful 
uh, with regard to foreign affairs, um, unless the president and his cabinet knows how to work with Congress and secure public support for their policies. Um, and your book discusses the very uh, close relationship that Secretary of State George Marshall had with Senator Vandenberg in the early post-World uh, post War II years uh, when they worked on European uh, reconstruction um, and that George Marshall actually stated that Vandenberg's name should be associated with the Marshall Plan, which of course was named after him. Um, so obviously today we have a president, uh, Joe Biden, who is a long-term senator, who has clearly stated repeatedly that he would like to work with Congress. Um, Blinken as Secretary of State is somebody with long experience. But Washington's very polarized. Do you think that it will be possible in the near future for the president and Congress to work together in the way you clearly think is most beneficial to U.S. foreign policy? So let me give you a little background on this. Uh, perhaps like a lot of your students, uh, sort of came up uh, what I'll call the technocratic path. It was sort of analytical and law school and public policy and foreign relations. So I didn't consider myself a deeply politically partisan person. But one of the things you learn in the U.S. system is at, at root, it's a democracy, right? It's, and so you got to have a sense of how politics uh, and, and Congress plays into this. And I had the good fortune of working for James Baker, who was quite skilled at, at, at both sides, learning a lot about this, because many foreign policy experts sort of want to wish this away. For those of you that have come across the name George Kennan, you know, you read how George Kennan talked about Congress and you could see why they never sort of let him up on the hill. Um, and when I would work in the State Department, for some of you interested in the Foreign Service, I was always intrigued that many of our Foreign Service officers had, you know, extraordinary knowledge of kind of the formal and informal politics of different countries. And yet when I talk about getting political support at home, it was kind of they left off in fifth grade. You know, we got three branches of government and, you know, this is how a bill is made. And the reality is you have to be able to sort of bring along the domestic politics. Lincoln had a wonderful phrase, which uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, all these successful leaders mentioned. He said, in, in the end, public opinion, public attitudes in the United States are everything for your success. So you're right, I used the chapter uh, on the 47-49 alliance to talk about the role that Vandenberg played. But if you think about more recent times, you'd have people like John McCain, Senator Luger of Indiana, Sam Nunn, uh, and then as you legitimately ask, well, what about today? And they're there, uh, you know, the, just to give you a feeling, um, I wrote a piece in the Financial Times about a week or so ago uh, talking about urging a North American, by the way, notice not U.S., North American, U.K. sort of trade agreement. And um, I, part of it came from a conversation with one of the Republican senators on the Finance Committee that said, you know, I think we could work with the Democrats to extend the trade negotiating authority for that sort of agreement. Um, I mentioned science and technology, and you'll see people that are sort of co-sponsors of some of the bills in that area. Uh, certainly, you tend to see this more in some of the defense and national security uh, committees. Um, in the area of cyber, there was a very interesting report put out by a congressman from Wisconsin, uh, Matt Gallagher, who I think actually got his doctorate from Georgetown. He did his doctorate on, on the Solarium Project, the Eisenhower's sort of foreign policy strategy. And he did it with Angus King, the independent of Maine. So they're there. Uh, but the question is, in a sense, <laughs> do we encourage and, and reward them? For, for the current administration, as you mentioned, I, uh, I've long felt that, you know, in some ways, uh, President Biden's got more experience with Congress than any president since LBJ. That should be kind of his strength. Uh, Tony Blinken, while he served in, a, in the Obama administration and the Clinton administration, a lot of his experience came with the staff director of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, that's got good and bad aspects. So you can see, for those of you who watch this, they were very quick after they have the, their names nominated to call the committee members, get the, the, the process for confirmation. There's an important aspect to that. There are some risks to the senatorial style too. Uh, not being disrespectful, but a lot of senators, if you think about it, their job is they get asked a question, it's how do they 
uh, say something that appeals well to people for the moment, uh, not necessarily thinking about kind of uh, trying to put together a larger diplomatic strategy. And again, just to give you a little sense of how these are interconnected, I mentioned Secretary of State James Baker. Uh, in the first Gulf War, so in 1990, some of you may recall, he actually uh, pushed hard to get a UN Security Council resolution to back the U.S. action, in part because he knew that the vote in the Senate would be very close. And he realized that if he got the UN Security Council to back it, it'd be harder for opposition senators to oppose it. And I think the vote was only 52, sort of 48. So that's part of the challenge going forward. Today, um, the issue to watch is China. You know, there's, uh, on, on one hand, you could say uh, there was a bipartisan uh, frustration with China. In my view, some of this might be, uh, have extended a little too far in terms of some of the, uh, the approach of just trying to rate sort of a conflict as opposed to trying to figure out a more complex policy. <laughs> but I was just exchanging notes with some friends recently. They were noting that if you listen to the CPAC conference, or at least saw reports of it recently, um, China, China today could start to look like China in 1949. And for what I mean by that is it starts to become the partisan policy that sort of led the McCarthyism to attack uh, the opposition party if they show any cooperation with China. And this had a profound influence on policy dating all the way up to the Vietnam War. If you look at the, the, the thinking of LBJ, he was very fearful of being attacked, of losing Vietnam. And it's one of the reasons he actually uh, got more deeply involved with US forces, in my view, in a very tragic mistake. And to bring it back to the trade policy issue that we've discussed, this is a good example. You know, President Obama was also a little worried about trade in his constituencies. So if you, if you look at his first term, he really didn't talk about the trade issue too much. And his, his US trade representative actually said, oh, we don't want all these trade deals. In the second term, you'll see that they moved a friend of mine, Mike Froman, who had been on the White House staff to become U.S. Trade Representative. And the then NSC uh, advisor, Tom Donlan, another friend, said he'd showed President Obama kind of the shifting trade patterns in with Korea and others in, the, in East Asia and led Obama to realize he needed to move ahead with this Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And then to deal with the reality of politics, frankly, they just got it done about a year too late. If they got it done in 2015, the Republican uh, Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, who had passed Trade Promotion Authority, I think would have passed TPP. But by getting it done in 2016 election year, they didn't get it done. And frankly, I think we're behind the curve. So this is a good example of saying you know, this gives you a sense of the politics kind of, but also the need for congressional support, timing. You know, if, if, if the Obama presidency hadn't wasted the first four years, you would have gotten that done. So, and that's also another practical side of what I try to draw out in the book is that it's not enough to have good ideas, you have to get them done, and often that requires a sense of timing. Okay, that's that theme of pragmatism coming back. Um, not just the ideas, but the pragmatic doer. That is uh, the key to the book. All right, the last question, and I'm delighted to see some of you uh, putting your questions in the chat. Um, you will have an opportunity to unmute and um, speak your question yourself rather than have me channel it. Um, so I'm just flagging that for you so you guys can get ready. I know how my children, my college age children sometimes go to class and go to events. They might not be ready to unmute and ask. So I'm giving you fair warning. Um, the last tradition that you write about in your book, Bob, is uh, what you call America's purpose. You write that as a country founded on ideals of liberty and independence, the United States from the beginning imagined that it came uh, into being to serve a higher purpose. Woodrow Wilson once stated that the United States wanted to make the world safe for democracy. Other statesmen um, believe that the rule of law uh, was critical and worked to promote rule of law and human rights. Um, obviously, in recent years, U.S. support for human rights has gone down, and we clearly see uh, the events of January 6th illustrating that many Americans not only refuse to accept the results of a free and fair election, but are also willing to use violence um, 
to overturn it. And your book notes that U.S. diplomacy works best when American statesmen are able to synchronize domestic purpose and foreign affairs. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of promoting um, its ideas abroad at this particular historical juncture? So my favorite way to make this point is for those of you that still carry cash, and that may be a generational thing, uh, take out a dollar bill sometime and look at the back of the dollar bill. And you'll see this great seal of the United States. You probably haven't ever paid much attention to it. Well, <clears throat> the reverse of the great seal has this unfinished pyramid. Notice it's unfinished. There's an eye of providence above it. And below it is the phrase novus ordo seclorum, new order of the ages. And so from the very start of the United States, these people were thinking about bigger ideas here. <laughs> they were trying to build something somewhat special. And one of the points that I, I made, as you touched on, Anne-Marie, is that the notion of what that purpose was changed over time. In the early 19th century, it was simply to preserve a republic in a world of empires. This was a novel thing. It hadn't worked out so well. It didn't work out so well in France. Then, of course, you have the Civil War, preserving the whole notion of union. Now, by 1900, it's kind of the United States is a power, and how does it engage a balance of power politics? You mentioned Woodrow Wilson as make the world safer democracy. For those of you that have still learned how to write, which is rare now these days, I have to say, notice it's a passive voice that makes the world safer democracy. He's not a strength, uh, not, he doesn't have the exact subject player, but he's, he's trying to defend the system here. Um, and then, of course, in the Cold War, it's the United States is the leader of the free world and uh, trying to have, for Clinton, it's the indispensable power. It's always been there, but my view is it, it it shifts depending on three aspects. One, the external environment. Of course, what are you dealing with? Number two, the public attitude. But then three, how does this push for democracy, republics, human rights, freedom? How does it, how does it take form? And that's part of the challenges uh, going forward. Now, you mentioned uh, the situation on January 6th. So, you know, it, it was terrible. It's, and it creates a terrible message for the United States abroad. Authoritarian countries kind of use this as they often will do. Uh, the other side, having been involved with these issues in many capacities for decades now, it's useful to keep in mind authoritarian systems have their problems too, but however, they don't want their, uh, their clothes in public on this. And so, you know, you can be certain China's got its own sort of big problems uh, within the system. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think that the rule of law, the notion of the constitutional order, and certainly peaceful transfer of power, these are core elements of the U.S. system. I would actually apply this in my foreign policy. I, when, when Russia clearly engaged in cyber attacks on the American democratic system, I think both Obama was too weak on this and Trump was goodness knows what on it. But so this to me would be a rather fundamental issue for us. Um, having said that, you know, to kind of put this in a perspective, Sometimes you know, I, I get friends in Europe or Asia that, that just get very gloomy about this. Keep in mind, we just saw an election that took place during a pandemic uh, with a lot of mail-in votes for the first time. And if you watch those election workers around America, these were courageous people and they were very devoted people. If you look at almost all of the state election authorities, you know, they're often the secretaries of state, they, they were very committed to trying to sort of do this right. And, you know, and then even on January 6th, the Congress reconvenes and does what it should do. So it didn't meet the standard that I would like. Um, but, you know, we can take some sense that this is the way the American system, if we all participate in it, kind of pushes back. At the same time, since Sam Marie, since you went to Ben Franklin, either high school or junior high, um, I'll return to Ben Franklin. And Ben Franklin had this wonderful comment after the Constitution was uh, agreed upon. He was met by people in Philadelphia, asked what happened, and he said, a republic if you can keep it. And that's a good message for people going forward. So, I mean, the one other point on this is, is that, you know, uh, while it's natural and people feeling strong about issues to be strong advocates, it's important to understand the system does require some negotiation, compromise, some respect for others' positions. 
and I'll apply this to both domestic and international politics, I always found that I could operate much more effectively if I tried to put myself in the shoes of the other person, to at least understand what they were thinking. I mean, often I wouldn't agree with them. I may actually share that sharp differences. It's very helpful to know where the other person is coming from, either to shape your own arguments or to try to frame some sort of solution. here. You're on mute. I forgot to unmute myself. My apologies. OK. Um, my apologies to the students, but the first question actually came in from Professor Edwards, so if he would like to unmute uh, that would be great. Um, good afternoon, the question's there. Uh, <laughs> sorry about this. Um, 40, so there's a, a, a Pew, um, uh, Thank you for talking to our students, by the way. I should lead with that. Um, right. It's a Pew Research sur a survey that says that 40% of Americans think that reducing bilateral trade deficits should be a top priority. So given that the debate about trade is just so screwy right now, to use a precise term, um, <laughs> how can we continue to push for continued openness? Given that we have to sort of start from basic essentials about, you know, trade deficits per se might not necessarily be the problem. Right. So um, just for 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 the students who may or may not have had economics, let me let me have a word on bilateral trade deficits, but then we'll come to the larger question. So what I often point out to people is the United States has a surplus with Australia. Australia has a surplus with China. China has a surplus with the United States. So what have we learned? Well, we've actually learned <laughs> how comparative uh, uh, sort of advantage works in trade policy. But the more simple example that I sometimes use is I have a trade deficit with my supermarket. Um, so I, I pay them more than they pay me. Now, I do have to pay them. Now, rather than get a job uh, putting uh, stock on the shelves at night, which would create a direct bilateral offset, I get money somewhere else and then pay. That's fundamentally what the nation of bilateral trade deficits. Now, then there's the question about your global trade deficit. And without getting into all the complex aspects of this, this really becomes a combination of how fast you're growing, what you're consuming, your savings rate, because the capital account is the reverse of the trade account. And so if you were if you have a greater trade deficit, you have to bring in capital, and that's a form of investment. Although, of course, it depends on how it's invested. But the, so, so uh, as, as the professor's question suggested, other than my supermarket example, it's hard to explain that to people, right? And the deficit looks like it's a profit and loss statement, so they, people don't like it. So on the broader trade question, it's interesting. You mentioned the Pew study. Um, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has been doing surveys, you know, for decades now, and the the data on trade is quite interesting. The support for for kind of believing the trade helps consumers, helps jobs, helps uh, the economy is in the 70 to 80 percentile, um, and even on, and is it good for workers? I think the most recent one was about 60 percent. Now the problem with that is. It's it's somewhat inchoate. That's a general attitude. And by the way, the numbers have gone up in the Trump administration, I suspect, because of two things. One is uh, a number of people didn't like Trump or sort of pro-trade, or frankly, it may be a younger generation that sort of understands the interconnections of things. But then the question is, how do you connect that with a vigil policy? And, and you know, this is where a little bit, if, if you take the discussion that Anne-Marie and I had on, on trade, I've suggested to for the, the, the Biden administration, if it's too hard to rejoin Trans-Pacific Partnership, what about this idea of doing something with Britain, where, by the way, if you're concerned about labor standards, we can't be too worried about labor and union standards in Britain compared to the United States. And it's a way of moving forward on the agenda and perhaps having an agreement that brings in some carbon issues and digital issues and sort of other advances. And notice what I'm also doing with the politics. When I did a lot of these free trade agreements, to be honest, a lot of the votes came, did you like Australia? Were you willing to do something with Latin American countries? You know, it became a, a response to the country. 
Now, I'm sorry, I was working in politics at the same time I was trying to work in foreign policy and economics. A lot of it depends on the support you build. And so this is where uh, to be effective with trade policy, um, the business community, the agriculture community, as I mentioned. And so sometimes people wonder why trade agreements focus so much on agriculture. A lot of it's politics. And keep in mind the sense that you know we've got a Senate that has two senators from each state. There's not a lot of farm business, but there's a lot of farm states. And so each of those senators is focused on trade policy. So as I've explained, for example, at the European Union, the things they blocked with biotechnology or some of the, the poultry or some of the meat because of hormones, these have particular negative effects. So it's, it's a question of, I think, a, a combination. You have to build constituency support going all the way back to sort of Cordell Hull's story. Um, you need the right political leadership. And let me share one more story on this. It's often said today, people say, oh, well, we could be open on trade, you know, in the 20th century or the middle because we had all this power and now we're under pressure. My story goes from 1947. So it's the height of American power. And a man who I bring back from history, Will Clayton, who was negotiating the GATT agreement, faced, it was only 23 economies at the start. And Congress passed a, I think it was a 50% wool tariff. And the Australians who were primarily at that age produced a lot of wool, said, look, if, if you do that tariff, we're dropping out. And then Britain, through the Commonwealth, said, if Australia drops out, we're dropping out. And frankly, if Britain dropped out, there wasn't much for Europe. So poor Will Clayton comes all the way back to see Harry Truman. And Harry Truman gives him 15 minutes, and he gives the Secretary of Agriculture 15 minutes. And I've been in meetings like this. The Secretary of Agriculture said, Mr. President, if you veto that wool tariff, you'll lose up to seven states in the 1948 election. And poor Clayton's having to make the case for international economy and getting Gatton off the ground. Harry Truman vetoed the bill, even gave authority to cut the wool tariff. And for those of you that haven't studied mid 20th century history, I'll tell you Truman did win the 1948 election. OK, um, we now have a question. We're going to get you back to great power politics. Leah Bordley. Hello, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. My question was, in the age of great power competition, what are the strategic areas of importance that we should be investing through diplomacy to counter the influence of Russia and China, keeping in mind that we don't want to overextend ourselves? Yeah, now that's a great question, Leah. And I'm going to I'm going to pull it, take it a little bit further out in that um, the there's been kind of a return in debate to sort of great power politics thinking. And um, to be honest, I, I approach this with a little bit of skepticism, but let me explain why. Frankly, I don't think we ever left great power politics behind. I mean, in all my era, we were working with China and Russia and other sort of players. Um, but in some ways, the great power paradigm comes from people like H.R. McMaster that did the national security report. And in a sense, you know, I don't take it away from him, but the Trump policy was a little chaotic and he was trying to create a structure over of sort of great power politics. The danger was is that it tended to look at great power politics as kind of a zero sum calculation. And, you know, it's a win lose sort of model. Um, and uh, and in some ways, maybe even sort of lose lose. And if you if you take the rhetoric and the policies, it was the idea that that simply by confronting the other country or, you know, uh, even sort of creating sense of tension or conflict, you were going to accomplish something. If you go back to my logic, uh, I've had to deal with some pretty dastardly people over time, but I try to get an idea of what are the results. Now, what I pose with the great power is the topic that, that Anne-Marie brought, brought in of transnational relations. So for those that want to decouple from China, how are you going to deal with climate change? How are you going to deal with pandemics and biological security? How are you going to deal with the world economy? How are you going to deal with proliferation questions? And I mentioned, you know, the, in over the past 20 or 30 years, China lined up with the United States on about, oh, I think 182 out of 190 UN Security Council resolutions. We're we willing to put all those away. So I'm not suggesting by any means that one just concedes. I'm trying to explain that the, the, the picture is a little bit more complex. And so, I mean, at heart, as, as we've discussed, it starts with your strength at home. So one of the points that I differ quite strongly with is that 
we'll never compete with China by figuring out how we can cut ourselves off. So the idea that you know we'll close off our universities, we make it harder for people to come to America, we're not going to compete with authoritarian countries by trying to become more authoritarian. Our strength is our openness to our ideas, to people, to capital, to trade. That's what's been the genius of the United States over time. Then, of course, there's the investments in science and technology and the other things we talked about. Then there's the alliance relationships and partnerships. And here again, what you'll see in you, you, if you read news reports carefully about this or magazines like The Economist, you'll see that the Europeans or East Asians, they're not so big on decoupling from China. They want to defend against China. They want to try to kind of counter it, but they're not going to break and decouple with China. So how will you, how will you be effective as a coalition leader? So in a sense, what you're going to need is a more complex policy that sometimes, frankly, I think some of our military structure will have to change to have bigger, fewer big platforms like aircraft carriers and more submersibles and network defense systems. It'll be more of a uh, uh, what's called an anti-access area denial strategy, defense, as opposed to how you would go on offense. We've discovered land wars in Asia don't work so well for us, so maybe we'll be careful about that. So there's a certain defense component and deterrence component. There's a certain part of areas where you could try to find cooperation. There's areas where you're going to compete. And there is areas where, frankly, you're just going to manage some of your differences. And so, and that's true with any of the great powers. Now, just to give one other historical context that I sometimes use, the last time we really had a great power sort of competition was around the world of 1900. And you can imagine that again. But the, the composition would change. It would be the United States, China, sort of Russia because of geography and sort of perhaps energy resources, India, Japan having to have a complex relationship between the United States and China, Europe on maybe, you know, economic issues, we'll see on political security issues, Britain will have to find its place. And my caution, and this is, if you go back to the chapters in the book with Betty Roosevelt and others, is that's not such a stable world. And you have to be careful about how that's going to work. So it, we could drift in that direction, but <laughs> how close are you? You know, you're part of effective advocacy is knowing what the right phrase is. And great power sounds great, right? You're dealing with powers; they're big. You know, it's not enough to be powers; you have to be great powers. You see, there's an analogy I've drawn, which is uh, over the past decades or so, there's been an interest in grand strategy. Some of this came out of Yale. And notice, it's not enough to be strategy. We have to be grand strategy. And part of what I even suggest in my book is that you can, you can sometimes look back and sort of put a strategic design on something. But a lot of what people do are solving problems, not necessarily devising grand strategies, although I'm a believer that you should have frameworks in which you think about those. So I, I'm sorry to go on a little long, but your question allowed me to kind of make a methodological point as well. <laughs> OK, and you actually touched on some of the other questions we had on great powers. Um, this is probably going to have to be the last question. Brad Kaufman, you had a question about the use of historical memory. Yes, hello. Thanks for uh, talking to us today. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned how historical memory drives state action. Um, do you have any thoughts or suggestions on how the U.S. can foster cooperation between countries that have a history of conflict, uh, like Korea and Japan. That's a very interesting question. Um, it, and, and, and actually, um, at one point in my tenure, I, I actually tried to encourage uh, on the China-Japanese side some historical work to kind of uh, they have both sides sort of in a more neutral context sort of understand their sort of background. I, I think um, at heart, this is something where you can encourage the other countries. It has to come from them. So you mentioned the Japanese Korean case. Um, and obviously, for those of you that may not know this, but you know, Korea was a Japanese colony for a period. There's a lot of animosity and sensitivities you had issues uh, such as the comfort women in World War II. Um, and so understanding how countries view their relationships historically is, is quite important. I mean, th there was a period with North Africa, with, their, uh, with Algeria and its relationship with France. 
Um, if you think about um, uh, trying to deal with India today, India is very sensitive to its independence since it was a long period of a colony. The Chinese have this view about the century of humiliation, which by the way, I think is historically overwritten, stated, but nevertheless, it's how they view things. And so I think all you can try to do is in a sense, what our conversation and our book is trying to do is to try to encourage people in their own system to open up, to understand the context of these issues, get a better perspective, think about the, you know, the questions that one, so one would ask. Um, and, uh, and it has to, it's like the, a point that John Quincy Adams made about creating, he would use the word republics rather than democracy, is that it has to come from the people themselves. They have to own it. So it's like things in development. You can create the right environment. You can create the right encouragement. You can draw people into thinking environments where it's easier to do so. But ultimately, uh, they have to come to their own reconciliation as, as they take our relationship with Great Britain. OK, well, we are just about out of time. Um, so my apologies to all of you who posted questions um, that we didn't get to. Uh, hopefully at some point we can continue this conversation amongst ourselves. The book again is America in the World. It will be available shortly in the library. Um, at this point, I am supposed to turn it back to Dean Smith. Uh, but Bob, I really want to thank you for coming to Seton Hall, even in this virtual environment um, and sharing your wisdom with all of us. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for inviting me there. Great questions. Sorry, my answers ran on too long. <laughs> I like uh, the new feature in Teams that allows everybody to do the hand clapping. That's uh, much because uh, there's a lot of it going on right now, Bob. I'm not sure how familiar you are with this particular platform, but it's pretty new and everybody's got the hang of it already. So. Uh, thank you for a really great conversation, both for your insight and for um, for Anne-Marie guiding us through that to help reveal that insight to us. Um, I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be not only pulling for your book, but for other analyses of, you know, I was looking for on my bookshelf at one point for my copy of Newt Staten May, which I haven't pulled out in years. So uh, um, it's a nice reminder of how the lessons of history are very important for us moving forward and about connecting some of the challenges that we've experienced in the past into those that we're facing now. And I think you've woven those together in a very helpful way. So uh, thank you again to uh, Bob for joining us and sharing his insights. Thanks to all of you for joining in the conversation. And I truly hope um, that there will be an effort as, uh, as uh, Anne-Marie suggested to, to harness the really excellent questions that are in the chat and to continue those conversations on our own campus within our student organizations and in our classrooms. So um, thank you all again for a wonderful session and best wishes to everybody for the rest of your week. Thank you.